I thank you. I thank you that you have a plan A and that you don't need plan B. Whatever you said, you will do. Lord Jesus, we know that you're coming back again because you said you would. And we believe that you're faithful and just to be true to your word. Lord, we're seeing the signs that you said will happen at the time of your coming. We're seeing the intensity that, and the frequency of all these things, Lord. And Lord, I pray that we open our eyes and see. That we'll open our eyes and have understanding. Lord, I pray that as I continue to teach on this series, that you'll mend the broken relationships in our society even the broken relationships in the church, Lord, in the body of Christ, that you'll begin to clean up brokenness, that you'll begin to clean up what the enemy um, intends to, to destroy us, to harm us, to kill from us. Lord, that you would flip it around, that you would bring restoration, that you'll bring divine healing, and that you'll bring that, that life that you desire for us to live, that abundant life, that life that is filled with faith, that life that is filled with your goodness, Lord. And I pray that in the name of Jesus, every agenda of Satan, every plan and scheme of the enemy, every, everything that he's planned to do, Lord, I cancel it in the name of Jesus. I speak forth your word, Lord. I thank you that we are part on the winning side, Lord. We are part of the winning side, Lord. And I thank you in advance for the things that you're going to do today. And I thank you, Lord. Bring them, Lord. Bring those that you want to set free. Wherever they're from, Lord, those that you want to bring healing in their relationships, draw them to you, Lord. I thank you. Even those that are watching online and those that are experiencing freedom from uh, watching online, Lord, I thank you for what you're doing in this strategic time in their life, Lord. We give you glory. We give you honor. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Today I'm going to get into dating. And uh, for the married couples in here, uh, don't think that you're going to be here and, uh, and not receive anything because you're already married. Uh, I've got some stuff that I'll just input for you guys. Uh, and, and I believe that you will learn things. Uh, you will impart things uh, to your next generation. And even those that, that God blesses with people under your care, this is some things that you can use, tools that you can use to train them up. Uh, but we're going to talk about dating naked. How many know that in the beginning, Adam and Eve were naked and they felt no shame, baby? They were naked. They were, there was no shame. There was no hiding. There was no, there was no uh, fear of God. Their nakedness is not, I'm not talking about the physical nakedness. Yes, they were physically naked. But I believe uh, this openness, this, this, this nakedness before God, by the way, we have clothes. And you need to know that we're still naked before God. You have to understand that the eyes of the Lord sees beyond the very things that we project on the outside and he sees the soul of man. He sees our thoughts. He sees the inner motive of the human person. He sees everything that goes on in our mind. God delivered me in the beginning of my walk with him to understand a truth that has helped me in my walk with him over 10 years. What, what is that if you ask me? He has made me to understand, my son, anything that you do think or even plan to do is naked before me. I see it all, so don't bother hiding from me. Come to me, run to me. So when I struggled in my sin, when I struggled in my sexuality, I ran to him. I first believed the lie from the enemy that God has rejected me, that God has spat me out, that God doesn't want anything else to do with me, that God's plan is finished with me, but God made me understand that my throne of grace is open for you, and if I died for you while you were a sinner, what makes you think that I will leave you while you were my son or my child and I'm telling you God wants to break down the lies that we have believed that are not true last week we looked at the purpose of singleness our world talks about singleness as something that is a very unpleasant experience our world uh, teaches singleness to be something that we need to shy away from run away from that is just a temporary thing before the main thing which is marriage but last week we explored the purpose of singleness that the Bible teaches us that singleness is also a gift. There are a select few that remain celibate for their whole life, but if you even are very just cringing at that very thought, I guarantee you don't have this gift. But there are those that remain single for the rest of their life, and God blessed their work. And, and Paul says, I wish that all of you was as I am. 
And we know that Paul was single, and he talks about his singleness. And the purpose of uh, living a celibate life mainly is to live a life dedicated to pleasing the Lord and serving the Lord. Paul was uh, one, one of the major writers of the New Testament. He wrote 13 letters of the New Testament, and there is no way he would have achieved the height that he did if he was married. Because there's a wife that he needs to divide his attention to. And perhaps there might have been children that he needed to divide his attention to. So he speaks about the gift of singleness. How many know that Jesus, the ultimate example of living a, war, a life for Christ, living a life for God, was also single. He was never married. And we can see the achievement that he brought into the world. So we talked about the gift of singleness. And, and for those of us that are not, uh, by the way, let me just quickly put a, a point here. We see a lot of mess, especially within the Catholic uh, churches in this particular area. There's many priests that, that are celibate and, and they, they restrict themselves from being married or, or having any sexual union with, 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 with a married uh, partner that they have. But we see a lot of sexual abuse because it was never a gift. They, 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 they're trying to restrain what God has already, what God never gave them to restrain. They're trying to do it in their own strength. So this gift is a grace that only is given to the people that can cope, cope this kind of living. So I want you to know that if you have desires to marry someone, it, 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 most likely you don't have this gift. You don't have this gift to be a celibate. And, and it's not, it doesn't mean that it gets you closer to God. How many know that the cross has made us all equal? Being celibate doesn't mean that you are somehow more closer to hear the voice of God, but it is just an assignment that God has given to some people. And when he's given them that assignment, he gives them with understanding. So if you're single, I don't know, you might have that gift. But if you have the gift, you will know about it. So don't worry. If you're already stressing about it, most likely you don't have the gift. And we talked about quickly how marriage, a lot of us view marriage as a savior. We think that when we're married, that somehow all of our problems will be fixed. We think that the issues that we have, that marriage will deliver us, that the, that the sanctity of marriage will set us free from all of our pornographic addiction. We think that marriage is a solution to all of our sexual desires. But the Bible teaches us that marriage is not your savior. There is one savior and his name is Jesus Christ. So we talked about how this idea that marriage will solve every emotional, uh, emotional need that you have, everything that, that you think that marriage will fix, we, we've talked about that idea is, is ultimately fulfilled in Christ. He talked to the woman in the well and she was married five times and the man that she's living with is not really her husband. Jesus knew that. She didn't know that Jesus knew, but Jesus knows all things because he sees past the, the, the lip service that we give them. He sees the heart condition and she says, ah, you must have been a prophet. And he showed us something. He said, woman, if you came to me, I would have given you water and you would never come and be thirsty again. And she said, I want this water, Jesus. Give me this water so I don't come back to this Jacob's well and drink again. She understood it naturally what Jesus was communicating at a higher level spiritually. What Jesus was saying, in essence, is that the thirst of your soul can only be quenched by me. And many times we think that another man will, will, will quench the thirst of the soul. And, and, and that is why the divorce rate is so high, because we think that marriage will solve the inner thirst that we have inside of us but we, we get married and we find out that marriage was not there so if marriage was the ultimate thing in life and, and I got it and I don't have it then what will there's the same thing with money some people think that money has all the solution that when I get money, when I get millions of dollars, my anxiety will wipe away, I'll buy a house for my mom I'll buy a house for my dad, I'll buy a house for my parents I should say not Anyways, I'll buy a house for my siblings. I'll buy a big church. How's that? I will make a spiritual. I'll buy a big church. But the research and the statistics say something else. The lottery winners, they lose it within the first two to three years. Their money is gone. And a lot of times, their families are divided. Because... Everyone comes. All of a sudden, money attracts, it's like a magnet. It attracts people that never knew. Oh, I'm your uncle. <laughs> I'm your long lost brother. And you're like, where were you when I needed you? But now when you know that I've got something to offer you, you come. See, sometimes there's people like that that will come to your life to get something from you and not something that they will give back to you. 
But I'll talk about that in the friendship part. But marriage is not the answer to all of your problems. Marriage is not a savior. Jesus is a savior. That's why we have to go back to him. So if you're depressed in your singleness, you will not be happy in your marriage. Go to Jesus in your depression. He will set you free. And baby, when you're married, you'll be joyful. Amen? Because the source of everything that we need is Christ himself. He is the vine that the branch is connected to. He is the supplier of the nutrients that the branch needs. He is the one that gives. If we're not attached to him, apart from him, there is no life. As a fish without water is dead, us, apart from God, we're dead. I spoke about it in the first time. I know my wife, you told me, don't spend too much on recapping, but I just have to. The Spirit of God is just leading me to this. She's like, oh, you spend so much time on that. And, 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 and in the first series, I said, the problem that we have in society, the brokenness, the ugliness, is because we have denied and rejected our God and our Creator. Everything begins with Him. That's why Jesus, when He talked about divorce, He said, in the beginning, my plan, God's plan, our plan was never like that. Divorce was never part of it. Then they said, Jesus, then why did Moses give us a certificate of divorce? He said, because of your hearts. He said, your hearts are hard. So he permitted it to control it. <laughs> Some of you will get that later. Today I want to get into dating. Let's lay basic foundations to build on what dating involves I want to give you, I want to take it really slow because I don't want to rush into it. And I want to go make it really plain, really real. And, and, and those of you who are not married, you'll be like, thank God I'm receiving this teaching. Uh, and those of you who are married, we'll have a session to solve another thing. Um, because this, but this will help us. This will help us to, to, to teach others also. You know, there are thousands of decisions that we make daily. I've talked about some ridiculous um, a figure when I teach on the Holy Spirit once. Research that's been done. Thousands of decisions a day that we make. Uh, some we do subconsciously because our brain has developed a, part, a pattern. So we wake up and we just do certain things. You know, we just wake up. <gasps> phone and then Instagram and Facebook. We just do some things, you know, subconsciously. And some things we, 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 we make a decision. We make a plan upon. We plan to meet with someone. We plan to go to work. We plan to call in sick when we're not really sick. And okay, I'll come to that another time. But what we must understand is how much our decisions affect our lives. There are decisions that we make that have a tremendous consequence upon our life. One wrong decision can alter the course of your life. You can have this conversation with a man named Esau. One lentil soup can change the course of your life. One of the most important decisions we make in life is choosing who we spend the rest of our lives with. I would say the second most important decision, first being our salvation. So if you never had made the decision with salvation, this is a second less important decision. But salvation is the most important decision. But once we've got that clear, the second most important decision that we can make in life is who we spend the rest of our lives with. The bigger the decision naturally that we need to make in life, the more time that we need to make that decision. For example, you don't spend the same amount of time choosing what to eat as you do choosing the house that you will be living in. Some of you make that same amount of time to decide, especially my wife. What do you want to eat? Um, she said, I don't want to eat anything. And then I'll order the food. I'm like, are you sure you don't want anything? She's like, no, I don't want anything. Are you sure? Are you, I'm, I'm really hungry. I'm going to eat this food just by myself. Yeah, I'm not really. Just give me a drink. I'm like, all right. As soon as the burger comes... <laughs> Babe, can I have one bite? And, and all the married people that are men can say, that's it. <laughs> but more than buying a car, more than buying a house, more than moving countries, more than changing your career, choosing who you will marry surpasses all of these choices. One important reason why is because everything that I just mentioned, your career, moving nations, uh, whatever other major decisions, the house and stuff can be changed. 
You can move to, to Europe and then decide two years later, I don't like it, I'm coming back to Australia because Euros are not doing it for me. But if you marry someone, God does not give you the permit, God does not give you the allowance to change your mind. It's a permanent decision that we make. It is, it is a decision that we make before God and a covenant that we make before Him in sickness and in health, for better or for worse. When I have a lot of money and when I don't have anything, when I'm broke, it is a commitment that we make with the opposite sex for life. It is a union that is, that is acknowledged and, and, and recognized before the law court of God. And no matter what court system you go to, and they give you a certificate of divorce, that is void because the only certificate of divorce that God recognizes is one of sexual immorality and one that he said, if there's an unbelieving wife and an unbelieving husband or both ways, and one of them decides, uh, the unbelieving person decides to live, then you're set free from your obligation. That's the only other uh, 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 freedom that we have in that. But the divorce is something that is not part of the plan. You can't quit when it gets tough. You can't change your mind when you find someone else that you like. I know there's a lot of mess in the movies that we watch and, and they put ideas in our mind that if, I, if I'm married and then another woman comes and I develop this relationship with her and she wins my heart, that it's okay for me to leave my wife and start a relationship with this woman or for the, for the woman uh, with this man. But that is not something that God provides. Yes, your court, the Australian court might say, yes, you're divorced to that person and give you the di divorce certificate, but before God is not legally recognized. So God will not bless what he's already determined will not bless. Amen? I want to give us quickly some stats in Australia as of 2017 about marriage. There were 112,954 marriages granted in Australia in 2017. There were 49,032 marriages that were granted divorce in 2017. The median age was 45 for male and 42 for the female. The median duration of the marriage of the divorced couple was 12 years. One in five people will marry more than once in Australia. One in three people will end in divorce. Four in five couples live together before marriage. I'm going to deeply tackle this issue as well. That is now in Australia, 80.8 people 80.8, sorry, percent of people that, that, that before they get married, they live with one another. It was 16% in 1975, and it was less than 1% in 1901. But you can see the, the godlessness in society is, is increasing and increasing. 78% of weddings were conducted by a civil celebrant. 78%, I was shocked. That means not by a religious uh, minister. So it's not recognized. They don't want to make a commitment before God. You just rock up with whoever you want or you can even get someone to your wedding and, and legally by the government it's recognized, but they don't want to recognize it before God. They don't want religion to be part of it. <laughs> In 1902, 96.5 weddings, percent of weddings were conducted by a minister of religion. You can see how that has changed and turned around. The average age for marriage is 32 for male and 30 for female. After the same-sex same sex marriage laws were changed in December of 2017, there were, just in six months, 3,149 same-sex marriages in Australia. In six months. So we see the brokenness in our nation when it comes to relationships and marriage. Divorce is ugly because it doesn't affect just the two people that are divorcing, but it is, it is something that affects the children. It is something that affects the extended uh, relatives and, and family members, the in-laws. It is something that affects even the friendship circles of the couple. It is an ugly thing. No wonder why God said that he hates divorce. So, we so who we choose to marry is so important that the word of God gives us guidance in doing it. Firstly, I want to lay some basic principles that will help us when it comes to understanding God's will in decision making. This will help even the married couple because we are always striving to know and understand the will of God.
I just want to make this remark uh, that I wrote down quickly. Where we are today is determined by the decisions we made yesterday. You didn't just, oh, I'm in church today. It was preceded by a decision that you had to make. Everything that we are going through, everything that we're experiencing is based on decisions that we've made in our life. J. Robin Maxson and Gary Friesen in this book on uh, singleness, marriage, and the will of God, I, I found it to be very helpful on this subject. I read the material and, and, and I, I wrote down something that they wrote. When it comes to the will of God, there are four principles to remember. One, write this down. Where God commands, we must obey. I'll say that again. Where God commands, we must obey. Two, where there is no command, God gives us freedom and responsibility to choose. Three, where there is no command, God gives us wisdom to choose. And four, when we have chosen what is moral and wise, we must trust the sovereign God to work all the details together for good. So I'm going to just quickly explain what this means and then I'll share how selecting a partner is connected with this. It is vital then that we know what God clearly commands us to do and obey it in our life. Let's go to Colossians, Colossians sorry, chapter 1 verse 9 to 10. Colossians chapter 1 verse 9 to 10. Colossians uh, was, not actually, was a church that Paul actually didn't plant, um, but he loves, he heard a lot about this church and he, and he wrote this letter for them based on what he heard. But he said this, I want to focus on this particular part. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will, through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please Him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. That is an amazing prayer, and I pray that over our life. Paul's prayer was that for the Colossian Christians to know and understand the will of God so that they can live a life that pleases the Lord in every way. This is our goal as followers of Christ. Our goal is to live our life to please God. I'm going to share with you in this series, but God wants to deliver us from living a life of pleasing people. This is religious living. This is religious living. Your eyes are always on people. You always, what did that person think of me? Oh, oh, if I do this and they see me, what is that person going to say? That is religious living. And God wants to deliver you from that. God wants us to live our life, not with what people will say, but what would God say? Especially if you're Ethiopian and Eritrean in this room, you know that is so pre prevalent in our nation, in our culture. It's just in our blood. There's this saying, we say, so many lenyal. You all understand? Yeah? You understand our marriage? So, mini lenyal. We, we are in so many hardships. We go through so many things. We live with it because we're afraid of the opinion of others at the expense of neglecting the command of God. So what God wants to set us free is from living a life of pleasing people. We're not called to be people pleasers. <laughs> One person said uh, in, in a leadership remark, he said, if you are a Christian leader and you want to please everybody, go and sell some ice cream. You're in the wrong profession. You will not please people if you want at, at, to uh, live to please God. Not 100% of people will be pleased with you. But God is calling us. That is, he wants us to know with wisdom and understanding, with knowledge, to know his will so we can live a life to please the Lord. That is the goal of every human being. So when you stand before the creator, he will say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Well done, well done, well done. You did what I told you. You did what I told you. Yes, I commanded you, you did, you did it. You are not afraid of people's opinion. You trusted me. Hallelujah. I pray that God gives us 
that understanding. God's revealed will. So the first one, remember, where God commands, we must obey. God's revealed will are all the commands, the principles, the principles and the promises that are in the scriptures. So a lot of the questions that we have in life is easily sorted by God's command. Wherever you see a command in the word of God, we obey that. You don't need to wonder about it. You don't need to second guess it. You don't need to say interpretation. No, there's clear commands. There's clear principles. There is a direction. There is a manual for living. So that's where the will of God begins. Where there is a revealed will in the scriptures, of, in the scriptures we must obey. And this affects every aspect of our lives. God revealed will are not just about what we do, but who, by why we do what we do and how we do what we do. You know, when he talks about God's will, it's not just about our behaviors and our actions. We think sometimes Christianity is about ticking boxes. Oh, I'm going to be a good boy. I'm not going to swear. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do this. Then I'm a good Christian. That's not being a Christian. <laughs> That's legalism. Being a Christian is not about ticking boxes. Do you know God, he searches the, the, the motive of the human heart. His, his commands are not just do this and do that, but he deals with the, with, the, with the issue of the heart. He deals with the motives that why we do certain things. You know, some people give gifts to get into the, into the life of, of a person. Or, or some people give gifts to get something back in return. Oh, that is so, I don't know about different cultures here, but in Ethiopia, it's so, so true. If you give a gift, if I go and give a gift to Wadase on her birthday, I expect her to give a gift back to me on my birthday. <laughs> if she doesn't, even invitation, we invite someone for breakfast or for, for, for dinner, we expect it. We don't say it. We don't say I expect it, but we, inside, we expect it. <laughs> but God searches that. So do you know what Jesus said? He said to the Pharisees, when you give, yes, people think you're, you're being righteous and you're being holy and you're doing the duty to give to God. But when you give, people see the amount you give, but I don't see that. He says, I see your heart and your heart is wrong. Your motive is wrong. You're doing it so that they can see that you're giving. And because of that, the reward that you've received is a clap from them, but nothing from me. God searches the motives. So the commands of God is not just this shallow thing. It deals with the, with the inner man as well as it deals, deals with the outer man. Hallelujah. God is more concerned on our motives, attitudes, as he sees the naked man, the whole man, the inner and the outer. He gave us his will for us to thrive and not just survive. One major, the person in this book that wrote this, one major reason why people, even Christians, make poor decisions is that they elevate their own reasoning and desires over God's revealed will. Just, that just makes it more plain. A lot of the times, even us Christians, I've done it myself, I'm guilty of this. A lot of the time, especially in my early walk with the Lord, I still do it today, but especially it was more frequent in my early walk. I would justify certain things and I will go ahead and do it, not because I don't understand the revealed principle of God or the will of God in that, but my desire, my desire outweighs that. So I, re I reject all of the prompting and the way out that the Holy Spirit shows me and I do it anyway because I want to do that. My heart wants to do that thing. So God, he wants to deliver us from that. He wants to deliver us from making poor choices. Proverbs 3, 5 to 7. Proverbs 3, 5 to 7. I'm going to go quick. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Hallelujah. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't just trust Him when things are going good. Trust Him at all times. Don't just trust Him with certain parts of your life. Trust Him in all areas of your life. Trust in the Lord. And lean not on your own understanding. Friends, if we lean on our own understanding, we will, we will, we will suffer. We will struggle. Because some things we don't just get. Some things, you're, Job, you're not going to understand some things. The Bible says he was a righteous man and did, he, he loved the Lord. But he went through hell. You're not going to understand, Job. But in the end, trust, trust his working. Trust his plan. Lean not on your own understanding and quit prematurely. Because God's blessing is coming. In all your ways. This is so important for Christians. In all your ways, what does it say? Submit to him. 
Submit it to him. Don't give him your Sundays. Give him your Monday. Give him your Tuesday. Give him your Wednesday. Give him your Thursday. Give him your Friday. Give him your Saturday. And give him your Sunday. Every day. All your ways. Everything that we do, submit it to him. And he, this is a promise by the way. And he will make your paths straight. Listen to this. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. Do you remember what Paul said in Romans chapter 1? I shared a couple of weeks back. Do you remember what Paul said in Romans chapter 1? How godlessness and all that and how man became wicked is because they rejected the law of God and the word of God. When we reject God and his revealed truth and become wise in our own eyes, we become fools. Do you know what the Bible says? The fool says in his heart that there is no God. Guess who says there is no God in our society? Scientists. So what society esteems as the, the, as the, as the, uh, the smartest, as the people that are just the, up there in society, God says, you're a fool. If we reject God, his word, his command, his truth, do you know what happens? This is what Romans chapter 1, Paul basically says, summed up. Then anything goes. We do what seems right in our own eyes and we become mini gods of our lives. When we refuse to submit to God and his will, we become the God of our life. Paul said in Romans chapter 1, the people that rejected the truth, they invented ways of doing evil. That's what's happening in our world now. (laughs) They will invent ways of doing evil. Rather than discouraging people, he said they will encourage people to join them in the things that they're doing. That's what Paul said in Romans chapter 1. The evil that is so rampant in our society is a direct result of man's rejection of God and his truth. Every brokenness, I promise you, every brokenness, every murder, every sexual abuse, every anger, every violence, every hatred, every racism, every perversion, every cruelty, and I can go on forever, exist in our world because of man's rejection at God's revealed will and God's revealed word. You should say amen there. That's, that's a good word right there. To understand the principle of God's will, we need to go back to the beginning quickly. Genesis 2, 16 to 17. So applying this principle, where God commands, we must obey. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any. Can you say any? Oh, come on, you can do better than that. Say any. You are free to eat from any any of the tree in the garden because I'm a good God and when I bless you I bless you good and you are free to eat from any can you all say with me but But. whenever you see a but in scriptures you need to pay attention because there's a condition there anything is yours you can have it it's all yours I give you the freedom I enjoy it I created you I created it so you can rule over it I created so you can subdue the earth you I created this for you but You must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. God commanded, so there is something that Adam needed to obey. He said, you are free to eat from any of the tree of the garden. So we see the goodness of God in giving Adam tremendous amount of freedom and choice. Do you know this is one of the lies of the enemy, that as Christians we're restricted in our choice? We are the most freed creatures on earth. As Christians, if you really understood the gospel, we are the most freed freed Christians in life. A person that knows Christ, we are free. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Hallelujah. But the freedom that God gave the man had a specific condition and a boundary. God gave Adam a clear explanation of his freedom and then one restriction with an explanation, not just of the restriction, but with an explanation of the consequence. He said, if you eat of this, what's the consequence? You will surely die. God gave Adam a clear explanation of his freedom and the one restriction with an explanation of the consequence of choosing the forbidden fruit. This is often the case with God's will. Our rejection of his instructions have consequences. 
This really bugs me. When I read this, something just really bugs me. They were free to eat of any except the one tree. That is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Any fruit except the one. And this, by the way, is a peach. I just messed up some of your theology. Because we believe it's an apple. <laughs> but the Bible doesn't say an apple. It just says a fruit. I'm going to mess up your theology. So it's a, I just say it's a peach. What, what attracts us to the forbidden? That's the question that I began to think. Because they had tremendous amount of freedom. Any except the one. And I always thought it's just their desire and all this. But what truly attracted them to the forbidden? What attracts us today? We're in the house of God. What attracts us to what God commanded us not to do? What, why do we want the forbidden things? I was just thinking. I was just, I was just meditating on this. Ladies and gentlemen, the answer is very simple, yet profound and powerful. It was the lie of the serpent that attracted them to the forbidden. A lie attracted them to the forbidden, while the truth blinded them to their freedom. A lie. Whenever we take the fruit that is forbidden, remember, we are deceived in believing a lie. We think we're smart. We think that we know what we're doing. We think that our life is in our hand. But every time we take a bite of the forbidden, I would love to take a bite of this right now, but it might like, in, like hinder my speech, so I'm not going to do it. Where's Zoe? Zoe here? Okay, she's gone. But every time we take a bite of the forbidden, we are biting into the lie of the serpent. We bite into his lies all the time. We think that we're getting what was promised, but we discover it, was, it just left us naked, ashamed, and hiding. The lie was that that will give us certain things, the forbidden fruit. It will give us a certain thing that we never had with God, that, that somehow that what God didn't already give us is found in the lie. But the lie is not a lie. The thing you have to understand with deception is deceiving. No one that's part of a cult, no one that's part of a great deception, for them it's a true, it's truth. For them it's not a lie. For them it's the, it's the very thing that, that sustains, for them they believe it with all their heart, they will die for the cause. The thing about deception is that it's deceiving. <laughs> Eric, uh, my friend Eric, he said something profound that I said to him, I'm going to say it, and he gave me the permission. Do you know what he said? He said, the grass looks greener on the other side because it's fake. I said, like, whoa, that's, there's so much, in, I could preach on that. Do you know how we always think? Like, if you're a Christian, you always think somehow you're missing out in the world. Like, the fun is there. Like, life is there. So Satan has sold this lie, and we're biting it every day. We bite it. We get into wrong relationships. We're biting into the lie. We have sex all the time. We're biting into the lie. The thing that God forbids, we bite it because we think that's the truth. So what Satan promised us left, left us naked, ashamed, and hiding from God. What are you biting, church? What are you biting? What are you biting that God forbid? When it comes to relationships, I'm coming after the devil and his lies. Sex is good in the covenant of marriage. Apart from that, we're eating the forbidden fruit. And every bite will cost you. Every bite will cost you. And I'll deal with this extensively as we go on. Fake things always seem attractive. <laughs> I can say so many inappropriate things right there. The real grass takes time to make. It takes time to maintain. And it might go through dry seasons. But your dry grass, you're trying to water it, and your neighbor is smiling because his grass is green. Adam and Eve thought that there was something that will benefit them that God is withholding from them. 
What a deception to think that God's commands are, are there to restrict us and not give us a life of freedom. This is the deception of the serpent, not just in our generation, from the beginning of time. That somehow the commands of God, the word of God is there to restrict us and not to free us. But I'm coming after his lie. And many are today biting into the lie of the serpent. I want us to have a clear thing, and I'll finish with this thought. A clear instruction Paul gives that it's applicable here in regarding to the spouse that we choose. 1 Corinthians 7, 39. 1 Corinthians 7, 39. I'll be reading the NIV. A woman is bound to her husband as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she is free to marry anyone she wishes. But he must belong to the Lord. We learn a few things here that we can apply. Paul makes the will of God clear here. A married person, number one, is bound. <laughs> You're cleaved. There's no way that we're going with that. With our married partner, we're cleaved together. We're, 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 we're bound together. We're not, we, there's nothing that will separate people that are married. So as long as we live, we're bound before the eyes of God. But if a husband dies, which is one of the permission to get married again, but he gives us a tool here that, that attacks the notion that we believe to be true in our life. He said she is free to marry her soulmate. Is that what he says? Does it say that? What does it say, Jacob? Anyone she? There's the freedom that Adam had. Any tree you wish you can have. Any tree, Adam. <laughs> Anyone. But, there's another but here, is there? I hope there's a but. Yes, there's a but. <laughs> but, one condition. With a command, one condition. What's that, Jacob? He must belong to the Lord. He must belong to the Lord. Freedom, not soulmate. You know, some of us, when we're dating, we think there's only one person out there, so we get stressed out. We get stressed out. I need to find the one. Do, 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 do. Are you the one? Nah. Do, do, do. So, so it's shows that are designed to help us find the one. Are you the one? There's a show called Are You the One? <laughs> you got it. Thank you. But, but um, <laughs> I'm trying to be funny, by the way. Um, but he gives certain instructions here. I'm finishing up. But he must belong to the Lord. She can marry anyone she, she wishes. So your, our selection is, is plenty. Is any, any person that loves the Lord, that belongs to the Lord. But why are we so attracted to the forbidden fruit? He said, but, can you go to that scripture again? But, what did he say? As long, but he must belong to the Lord. That is the first principle that I want to lay down when it comes to the will of God, to the person that we spend the rest of our life with. And next week, I'm going to go deeper into it. But this is the first principle. Paul is giving guidance to someone who is remarrying after the spouse dies. But his instruction gives us a framework in understanding that God gives freedom for us to choose. But the forbidden fruit is not to marry an unbeliever. The only condition is that he must belong to the Lord. The second principle is that where there is no command, God gives us freedom and responsibility to choose. With these quick remarks, what principles can be applied here? So where there is no direct command, for example, what house should I buy? God doesn't say buy the house on Gordon Street, 89. You know, it's not going to say that. There's, there's no scripture for that. So you can apply some principles. Does this decision bring glory to God where there is no command? We just need to, we have the freedom and responsibility to choose. Have I got adequate counsel over this decision? I'll touch on this as we go on. Third, where there is no command, God gives us wisdom to choose. James said, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask God and he will give him. Wisdom, in Proverbs, it says we need to pursue it. In other words, to get wisdom, we need to spend time in the word. We need to study diligently the word. You cannot rely on my wisdom. You need your own wisdom to make decisions in what is before you. Because every day you're faced with decisions that are not necessarily evil or God commanded against, but is this a wise decision that I'm making? So with this, there is wisdom that God requires us to give. And the fourth one is powerful. I'm going to have a whole preaching on this. 
when we have chosen the best and wisest decision. So for example, when you're finding a spouse, the person loves the Lord, you know, you know that that person loves the Lord <laughs> and not gives a, gives a um, uh, just, you know, I love Jesus just to get you and then, no, not that kind of stuff. I'm saying it really loves the Lord, genuine walk with God. I'll talk about online dating as well, by the way. You'll be surprised what I'm going to say about online dating. Um, but we need to know that God, we need to trust fourthly in the sovereign, sovereignty of God. To trust the sovereignty of God that he will work it out together. So if you're living for God and you're living under his command and, and you want to make wise decisions, I promise you that God is working all things out in your life. We can see this throughout the scriptures. When you're living under the counsel of God's word, God will direct your steps. Remember that God is the potter. He knows how to make something beautiful out of seemingly a lump of clay. Jesus is the carpenter. He knows how to make something beautiful out of wood. We see the sovereign hand of God throughout scripture. God working all things together for the good of those who love him. Choosing a lifetime spouse, as I finish, is the second most important decision that we make apart from salvation. It's a life commitment. Next week, I want to show you how the wrong choice will have a consequence for your life. A covenant, it's a covenant that is made before God. God has given us freedom to choose who we want to marry. The only condition, does that person belong to the Lord? Proverbs 18.22 is another evidence for this. He who finds a wife, not he who God connects him with, but he who finds a wife finds a good thing. Finds good, sorry. And receives favor from the Lord. Amen? So we need to, our job is to, there's a lot of fish there. There's a lot of fish out there that have the fish symbol in the back of their car. <laughs> and we have the freedom to select those who are genuine. But the <laughs> remember, where God commands, as I finish, I'll say this. Where God commands, this is so freeing for me even. Where God commands, we must obey. Where there is no command, freedom to choose responsibly. Where there is no command, we must choose wisely. And fourthly, trust the, sovereign, the sovereignty of God to work it all out. When I married Ayu, I had no idea. I know she loves the Lord. I know she, I know she knew that I, I love the Lord. But I had no idea. Do you know what? When we're dating, I'll share this with you as we go on. When we're dating, she was sure from, this, from the get-go that I was going to be the one for her. But I always said to her, I'm not that sure, are you? <laughs> the confidence that you have? No, seriously, I'm going to be really transparent. I said, I'm not that sure, are you? The confidence that you have? And, and, and she just knew, but she waited patiently. And, and then one day, it just... I'm like, I love this woman. I'm like, I can't, I can't spend any other day with her. But how, she's like, yeah. Um, but how that's going to look, I have no idea. I had no idea the things we're going to encounter. This is what I'm talking about. When you are living out with your partner, with your wife, wherever that is, God will work it all out. Don't be worried. Some, you know, some people, what holds them back from marriage? The fear and stress of marriage. That's not a burden that God gave you to carry. You don't, you don't have all the answers. What if, do you know what my wife used to fear? She used to have this genuine fear. I'm going to expose, I didn't give her permission, but she's my wife, I know. She said, you're not, I don't think I'm going to have a child. That's the fear she had. And I said, where did you get this idea from? She said, I don't know, I have this feeling that I'm not going to have a child. And we had to pray about it, and I had to say, just, just, just rebuke that idea. You don't know. You don't know anything. Why fear and worry about something that is not confirmed or anything like that? So I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, that who you marry is key and vital. And if you would remember one thing, I pray that you remember that. That you choose wisely. You can't redo it. I know our society says we can redo it, but you can't redo it. Bow your heads and let me pray with you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this word that you've given us. We thank you for the freedom that, that you're causing in our hearts. I thank you, Lord Jesus that your word is freedom. Your commands are not burdensome, as John says. Your commands are not there to restrict us or restrain us. Your commands are so freeing, Lord. You know how you wired us more than any other person. You're our creator, God. 
and we trust you. I pray for every person in this room, for, for the person that is single, for the person that is looking for a mate. I pray that they would understand that you have given them the freedom to choose anyone they wish to marry as long as that person loves you. I pray that we don't make the mistake of biting into this forbidden fruit, that we understand that you know more than we know. And Father, I pray that you would raise healthy marriages, healthy relationships in the church. Lord, that you will begin to heal brokenness, that you will begin to, to set free mindsets that are, that, are in, that, that, are, that are not in line with your truth, Lord. I thank you for the great work that you're doing. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Awesome. Joanne, just sit down.